They think justification is just the milk of the word. And when I believed on Jesus when I was seven and went to the altar call, I'm going to heaven now. But now I need to live a, a, a dutiful, faithful life of law keeping apart from Christ to be worthy of him. No. As he began, so you uh, by faith, we had to continue in faith. Whoever are justified by the law, you've fallen from grace. Now, these are people who were standing in grace. You can't fall from grace if you aren't standing in it. And our, this is not talking about your eternal position before God. That is secure. What it's talking about is your enjoyment of the blessing. To stand in the grace of Christ is to enjoy the blessing. person who has truly been born again. When Jesus says you must be born again, he's not just playing word games. He means you literally must be born again of spirit. Okay. Your inner man must be reborn. It must be a new creation. If that takes place, if you are truly regenerated, you are adopted into the family of God. You are now his child. And Jesus says that all who the father has sent me of them, I will lose none. That's not, there's no exceptions on that. There's no details. He said, of all of those the Father has sent to me, of those I will lose none. That, that's N-O-N-E, means none, zero, none of them. Which means if you have been reborn, you've been regenerated, you are forever his, okay? So you might fall away. You might have a Peter moment, a crisis of faith. But you will always be returned to the Lord because he does not undo his promises. His callings are beyond repentance, okay? They cannot be undone. If you are assured of your salvation the moment you were reborn because of the promises of God, Hebrews 10.10. 10. Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ, both near and far. This is Trevor with Dying to Live for Jesus, and it is my mission to seek the once saved. Just as James chapter 5, verse 19 and 20 tell all Christians to make it their mission to seek the lost who were once saved and are now wandering in darkness. And this is a very urgent message because for no other reason than the fact that salvation can be lost. So those who have been once saved, if they're not returned back to Jesus, that's not going to be a good eternal fate for them. And so I come very strongly against these very prominent doctrines within Christianity called eternal security and once saved, always saved, in which I'd say about 90% of Christians believe this uh, this great catalyst of the great falling away and rebellion towards God and the hearts of many Christians growing cold because they've believed this lie that uh, allows them to believe that there will be no that they can't lose their salvation and there's no penalty for leaving Jesus. So right here, we're going to have uh, two members of these small, smaller Christian communities. They're not mainstream, but they're people I've been dealing with a lot lately. Um, David Benjamin and Morris Blackburn. And what I'm starting to notice is they have theologies that are very good representatives for mainstream, for mainstream beliefs. Now, Lordship Salvation, which is what you see Morris Blackburn teaching, even though he's he's been among this group of believers that are free grace theology, but he's very much teaching the same thing that you would see like um, Paul Washer or John MacArthur or any of these Calvinist Lordship Salvationist teachers teach. Uh, you know, he believes that if you have really believed, then you're going to stay with Jesus until the end. Whereas David Benjamin believes just because you've believed and you do have salvation, it doesn't necessarily mean you would have to believe in Jesus until the end. But so these guys, they reflect two viewpoints that most Christians believe. Okay, for example, David Benjamin believes the same thing as Tony Evans believes, a very respected preacher, and also Charles Stanley, even though there's some things, some differences he would have with Charles Stanley. But Charles Stanley and Tony, he Tony Evans are two heavyweights within mainstream Protestant Christianity, and they... Uh, they they teach more or less the same thing that David David Benjamin teaches that once you believe in Jesus it doesn't matter if you apostatize afterwards it doesn't matter if you leave Jesus it doesn't matter if you turn from the faith you don't have to continue in the faith anymore 
Whereas what Morris Blackburn believes, John MacArthur, most Christians, uh, a, a, a decent majority, 55% or so of Christians, are going to tell you that because they believed, God's going to more or less bend their arm, take away their own choice to fall away. Okay, so you can see right here I have choice to continue in the faith. You know the the Christian's ability to choose to say to choose to stay with Jesus, just as we've believed. We believe, and we persevere. We endure. We continue in the faith in the same way that we've believed. So now the issue here is: Do we have the choice to do that? Do we have the choice to stay with Jesus, or do we have the choice to believe after we have genuinely believed in Jesus for salvation? So David's answer for this, Tony Evans' answers for this, Free Grace's answer for this is, yes, you absolutely have the choice. And I, of course, agree with this. You have the choice whether or not you're going to stay with Jesus the same way that you began to continue in the faith. Whereas somebody like Paul Washer or John MacArthur, and as you see Morris Blackburn say, they don't believe you really have the choice to do that. They just believe that if you have believed, God has already determined that you will stay with him. It's not about your choice. God is going to bend your arm and make you stay with him. You don't actually have, by your own volition, your own choice to stay, even though they might try to say, yeah, you'll choose because he chose you. But the truth of the matter is, they don't believe that they have the choice to walk away. Let's put it like that. That's what they're saying. They don't have the choice to walk away, whereas somebody like David Benjamin says, of course, you do have the choice, and I agree with that. This is what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches and warns of us not walking away from Jesus, that we have to continue in the faith just as we began, and yes, we do have the choice whether or not we're going to do this. So now I have necessity to continue in the faith. So is this, does this have to do with salvation? Will you have salvation if you choose to walk away from Jesus? Once again, David Benjamin, though he says you have the choice to continue in the faith of Christ Jesus, he goes on to say, but you can walk away from Jesus and that's not going to have to do with salvation. You'll still have salvation if you choose to walk away from Jesus, you simply won't have blessings in this life. You know, you won't uh, experience the blessing of it. I absolutely disagree with that. And I would say, yes, there is a necessity for us to continue in the faith of Christ Jesus. Just as we have a choice to continue, there's a necessity because we will not have salvation if we don't continue. And this is also in agreement with Morris Blackburn, Paul Washer, John MacArthur. They say there's a necessity to continue. Just as you saw Morris say, God will always, for anybody who has believed, he will bring them back because Jesus says he will lose none. So he's attaching the idea of continuing in the faith just as you began as a necessity. You won't have salvation if you don't continue. Therefore, you have no choice to walk away from Jesus if you have believed. Okay. So now what I want to do is I want to focus on these two statements that you see in red, these two red portions. And I want to point out the absurdity, the absolute absurdity of either one of these statements. And I want to use a parable to do that. But I want to show you that if they were to each delete their red statements and combine their green statements, they would have correct salvation theology. They would have correct post-conversion salvation theology. What happens to a Christian after they initially believe? What do they need to do to inherit the promise of eternal life? So I'm going to present to you a simple scenario in which two men are desperately in need of a Savior. They both enter into the Savior and then what happens after that? And we're going to look at the conversation they have with each other while they're in the Savior about what it would mean if they left the Savior. And, uh, and then we're going to take a look at what happens when temptation arises. When temptation arises, how are these two people going to react? And then we're going to bring in the voice of reason, this third perspective, and we're going to see if that third perspective is indeed a voice of reason and if it should be listened to instead. So you have two men that are on an island, and uh, their names are Morris and David. And Morris and David have just ran out of all food, and so now they're impending starvation. 
And so they're really hoping that they can make it to they can make it off of this island. The only problem is it's shark infested waters. They can't build enough, a big enough boat to stop these sharks from jumping into their boat. And really, they just need a savior. They need something with a really big ship. Somebody with a really big ship. Okay, so this big ship pulls up. And this is the ship of salvation. This is the ship of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it pulls up. And the captain of that ship tells them, come on, board the ship of salvation. All you have to do is board this ship. There's nothing else you have to do, and I'm going to take you all the way to eternal life. You just have to get on this ship, okay? So they they both just look at each other in amazement like, wow, we're about to receive eternal life, and we have to do nothing more than just to board this ship and get on this ship and go with him. Okay, so they get on the ship, and they, they make sure they got this right. They say, okay, so do we need to start paddling? You know, do we need to... Uh, radio in and 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 do these works in order to have salvation do do we need to uh you know conduct ourselves properly on this boat what what'd you say we need to do and once again the captain says all you need to do is be in this ship i've got this i've got everything taken care of you don't have to paddle just just sit right there i've got it all covered okay and so they begin doing that all right so they they go a little ways down and uh, they're, they're approaching their destination, but then they start to ask each other. They say, okay, now we got some pirate ships that are roaming around. They're blowing cannons at us. Uh, also, we saw these cruise ships pass by, and uh, they're going the opposite direction back to the island we came from, but they look really tempting, so... Let's talk this over. So Morris and uh, David have a conversation about what it would mean for them to get off of the ship. Okay, so this is where we're going to talk about their salvation in relationship to what they're going to say here. And let's think about these statements logically. So let's start with Morris. Morris is going to say, you know what? Those are some pretty rough temptations for us to get off this ship. But the captain told me that once I get on this ship, I have salvation. I, I'm, I'm as good as in the destination. So you know what that means to me? That must mean I don't have the ability to get off the ship. So even though I see these cannons and stuff and my instinct is like, I need to run, you know, and jump ship, I'm not able to. I must have some seatbelt fastened to me with a lock on it that just won't even allow me to leave. And those temptations, those things look pretty good. And in myself, I might choose to actually leave this ship and go after those things. But once again, impossible. I could never leave this ship. Okay. So now David turns to him and he says, really? That's absurd. That's what you think? That's what you think the captain meant when he said, come to this ship and you have salvation? You, you, you're going to be delivered? You think it means you actually can't leave him? No, he's obviously saying even if you do leave and you go back on, go back to that island on that cruise ship or, you know, you jump ship because you're afraid of the cannons coming at us, even if you do that, you're still going to make it to the to the to the place of refuge you're still going to make it to the other side this new place that we're going to you'll make it there no matter what so once again morris turns to him and he says are you serious that's absurd that makes absolutely no sense obviously we have to continue with him until the end so let's stop for a second and let's point out the absolute ridiculousness of each one of these statements from each of these individuals so david saying Okay, so we began by believing, we began by trusting that the captain's going to get us there, but now we can stop trusting and jump ship and leave and we'll still get there. Does that make sense? Whereas the other one notices that that doesn't make any sense and says, obviously, he meant that we have to stay with him until the end. We can't abandon trusting in him. That defeats the whole purpose of trusting him in the first place. So obviously, anyone who truly will be saved is going to be saved by staying until the end. But you know what that must mean? That must mean we don't even have a choice in the matter. We can't jump ship. The captain's just, you know, the captain promised us that he's going to, 
bolt fat fasten us to the chair and and hold us up and and bend our will and make sure we can't do it okay so then obviously the other one would rightfully look at the other one as being absurd and the other one would rightfully look at the other one as being absurd yet they're still sticking to both of their absurd conclusions so now i'd like to enter into this with the biblically backed voice of reason and that is, we do indeed have to continue in the faith all the way to the end, relying on only the captain. We don't try to row it ourselves. We're not basing it off of any good behavior inside the ship. We're simply staying in the ship all the way until the end, and that's the way we're going to be saved. But we also believe the captain when he says we have to stay, and we can't jump ship. So we can't jump ship and go back into the waters, back to that island, and and expect to be saved. And this is all what the Bible tells us. It tells us that we need to enter into the ship. We need to continue with the ship, abide in the ship that is Jesus, that is the gospel, just as David Benjamin so clearly says, we have to continue just as we began. But we're also warned about leaving. We're warned about leaving. So... uh just the idea that we're being warned breaks down both of these conclusions that they have. A, that you couldn't choose not to do it. Well, why would you be warned? And then to say that you could leave, you could just, that that goes completely against the warning. That's doing the exact thing that the warning tells you not to. And so just as the boat captain would tell you, come on this ship, all you have to do is come on this ship and that's how you're going to be saved. And that implies that if you jump ship, then it doesn't matter that you began trusting him. In the same way, that's the way the eternal security verses, the quote-unquote eternal security passages, the assurance passages work as well. 1 John chapter 5, 12, uh, 11 through 13 is a perfect example. He who has the Son has life. He who is on the ship is saved and is going to be saved. But verse 13 also reminds us, that we need to continue to believe in Jesus. If we stop focusing on Jesus and we stop abiding in him, keeping in remembrance the gospel promises, continuing to believe, then we're in jeopardy. We're in jeopardy of losing salvation because that's the only place salvation is. And any speak of works, any talk of works, just like if you listen to David Benjamin teach, he also clearly teaches that that's where the works come from. That's where that's where obedience comes from. It's still the same way in which we began. It's through faith. There's nothing you have to do besides to cling to Jesus by faith, and that's going to produce everything in you that is needed. So why is it when somebody like me teaches that we just need to continue by faith until the end, the same way that we started, it's alleged that I'm a work salvationist, that I'm pushing works in some way. Well, how could that be? That's just like on this ship. If the captain tells you, you don't have to steer, you don't have to paddle, you definitely can't swim. All you have to do is stay here, stay here. Well, how would that be works? Just as he told you when you enter, you don't have to paddle or swim or steer. Also, when you stay, you still don't have to paddle or swim or steer. So how come when I say, when you believed, you, you're you saved by believing, everyone says, well, that's faith. But when I say you're saved by staying with Jesus and continuing to believe, people want to allege that that's work salvation. Guys, that's a very hideous way of covering over the truth and suppressing the truth. The truth is that we have to continue by faith until the end. We cannot forsake the gospel. We cannot forget the gospel. We cannot leave Jesus by way of the gospel. We cannot leave by faith as we entered by faith and expect to have salvation. So right now, I just want to conclude by encouraging anybody who has jumped ship but is not dead yet that you don't serve a captain that's just going to not allow you to come back on if you have jumped ship and you're still alive. If you're not alive anymore, I don't think you can even hear this message. If you're spiritually dead, if you've fallen away completely. But for those who still have a heart that is a child of God and you realize that you have forsaken him and you have walked away from the gospel and you have backslidden, you have departed, James 5, 19 and 20, 
If one of you should wander from the truth and someone else should bring that person back, remember this, he who turns a sinner from the error of their way will cover over a multitude of sins and save that person from the snares of death. Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son who packed up and left, he walked away from the faith, okay? But when he found himself in a place of starvation, and he knew that it was due to the fact that he was no longer in his father's household. He had left his father's household. It says that the father was just waiting, waiting, anticipating, hoping that his son would return. And his son came to his senses, and he knew that the only way he could avoid death, which represents a spiritual death in this parable, is if he would return to the Father, that is to repent, to leave his way, return to the Father's way, and once again abide in the household of God. And we do that through Jesus Christ. And if we've wandered away from him, there is urgency, there is warning, there's an understanding that it only comes by him and we have to return to him. So this is a a dual message. This is for anybody who um, doesn't think they have to return to Jesus you need to understand that that's the worst mistake that you could make. Uh, likewise, equally, anybody who thinks that they they just have that they could never choose to leave Jesus. No, you have to follow Jesus. You have to choose to follow Jesus. But also to anybody who is afraid that they can't come back to Jesus. He's waiting for you. He's waiting for you to come back. He's not willing that any man should perish. You just have to leave the realm of the flesh because the flesh is opposition to the spirit. And if you walk in that way, if you're making that choice to live by the flesh instead, you can't have it both ways. If you're living by the flesh, that means you have left the faith. And the only way to eternal life is through the faith. And you need to return to the to the faith. You need to cry out to God by the spirit that he has allowed you to partake in before it's removed And you need to cry out to him and come back to him. And that is wholeheartedly because that's the only way that God will accept you. He's not going to accept a son back into his house holding on to prostitutes. Okay, if it's his, if you want to live in his house, it's understood that you have to be obedient to him. And that's not hard to do. Everyone who is born of God overcomes the world. If you want to choose Jesus, he's right there for you to choose him. If you want to reject Jesus, He'll be standing right there when you do. Come Lord Jesus, amen.